Okay, let's just pray together and we will get started. Uh, Thomas, can you pray? And then we will start, please. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day, Daddy. We bless mm -hmm. your holy name. Thank you for your mercy and grace, the divine wisdom to learn from your word a lot as we sit to listen and hear and learn from your word. Help us to understand mm -hmm. and uh, meditate your word and to learn something from your word a lot. Let the wisdom of God rest upon us. We thank you. We praise you. Continue to minister us, Holy Spirit. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 308, our course on Revelation and Daniel. Uh, we are working uh, through the book of Revelation, uh, verse by verse. We have covered till Revelation chapter 12. We've come to the end of um, Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to start today with Revelation chapter 13. Um, just to quickly review what we have seen, um, in uh, Revelation 11, Revelation chapter 11 is actually the uh, midpoint of the seven year tribulation, Revelation chapter 11. So chapter 11 is the beginning uh, of that midpoint. It's three and a half years into the seven year tribulation. Uh, we know that because it's clearly stated in chapter 11, in the very beginning, you know, uh, it talks about 42 months, chapter 11, verse 2, um, that the holy city will be trampled by the Gentiles for 42 months. So that's clearly three and a half years. And um, what we saw in chapter 11 was, it was about the two witnesses. And um, they will be, the two witnesses would be on the earth for that. 42 month period, uh, verse 3, Revelation 11, verse 3 says 1260 days. And chapter 11 gives us, you know, uh, an, an overview of what will happen during that uh, three and a half year ministry of the two witnesses. And of course, you know, we, we do our best uh, based on what we know from the rest of scripture to try and identify, you know, who these two witnesses would be and uh, what would be the possible ways in which they will come on the earth. And so this, this is our best understanding. And so we put some thoughts together on that. And then chapter 11, uh, the towards the end of chapter 11, it's that great announcement by the seventh angel or the seventh trumpet saying, um, you know, that uh, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, just announcing about what is going to happen. Then chapter 12, which we spent time in last week, is again, it is something that happens in the middle of the tribulation and goes on till the end of the tribulation. That is the second half of the tribulation, that three and a half year period. But chapter 12 is focusing on the dragon, uh, the red dragon, that is serpent. Uh, the, the the red dragon, the serpent, that is the devil, and it's basically telling us that, you know, uh, just to summarize chapter twelve, Satan is making one final attempt attempt uh, to penetrate heaven, uh, but uh, he's not uh, allowed to get in there. Uh, Michael and the archangels, his other angels, just stop him, and they push him back to the earth, and he comes with great anger. And knowing that his time is short, and then again, chapter 12 says, um, uh, verse 14 of, of chapter 12 says, it's for a time, times and half a time. So that means three and a half years. Or, um, yeah, so uh, it tells us very clearly that, you know, uh, this is for that three and a half year period, or 1,260 days. So he knows he has a short time. He's got only three and a half years left, and he comes with great vengeance. And his target... Is, his target is um, the people of Israel, and especially, like it says in Revelation 12, verse 17, are the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of 
Jesus. So it's basically he's going after Israel and he's going after the people who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. Right. So that's his target. The people who believe in Jesus Christ, he's going after them. Right. So that's where we stop. So this is what is going to happen in the second uh, half of the tribulation, the three and a half year period. Uh, uh, Satan is going to be going with the great wrath, the great anger, great vengeance against those who do not know Jesus. So that's why during the three and a half, uh, during the seven year tribulation, there will be people who turn to Jesus Christ. But it's going to be very difficult because, you know, the devil is going to do things to destroy them. Now, when we get into chapter 13, and I'll just give a little introduction and then we will read it. Very interestingly, chapter 13 kind of begins with some sort of description that is very similar to what we read in the book of Daniel. You see, in the book of Daniel, when we, especially when you read chapter 7 and 8, um, of course, in chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, we, we, we read in chapter 2, we read about this big image. In chapter 7, we read about these four beasts, you know, animal-like creatures. In chapter 8, we read about the goat and the... Uh, so, kidding. Um, the ram and the goat, we read about. And that's in chapter 8. Um, so it's all these pictures of animals, and especially in chapter 7, he sees these beasts coming with, you know, different horns and all of that. Now, here in chapter 13 of Revelation, it begins with similar picture. And so for us, it, it doesn't take us by surprise because, hey, we've read this in Daniel. And so we understand that uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, it is connected to what Daniel has already spoken. And then chapter 13 focuses on the beast and another beast, or which later on we'll find out it's the Antichrist and the false prophet. But in, in chapter 13, he's the Antichrist is referred to as the beast, and uh, the false prophet is referred to as the another beast later on in, in revelation 16 they refer to us the antichrist or the beast and so on so uh again chapter 13 is a narrative of what the antichrist and the false prophet will do in the three and a half year period in the second half of the tribulation so chapter 11 chapter 12 and chapter 13 are all descriptions of what happens in the three and a half year period, starting from the middle of the tribulation towards the end of the tribulation. Chapter 11 is about the two witnesses God sends. Chapter 12 is about what Satan, the dragon, does towards Israel and those who believe in Jesus Christ. And chapter 13 is about the Antichrist and the false prophet, what they will be doing in the second half of the tribulation, okay? So let's begin reading verse by verse, Revelation, the 13th chapter. And uh, uh, let's read, I think we can read all the way, the first 10 verses. Revelation, chapter 13, verses one to 10. Could uh, somebody read it out for us, please? All right, who wants to read? Anyone? Just your mic is all right. Just go ahead and read. Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead, Prince. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horn ten crowns, and on his head a plus. Bless sounds name. Blasphemous name, yeah. Blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And dragon gave him his power, his throne and great authority. And I saw one 
one of his hands as heads. if it heads as if it had been mortally wounded wounded and his deadly wounded was held and all the world marveled and followed the beast so they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worship the beast saying who is like the beast who is able to make war with him and he was given a mouth speaking great things and bless him bless him and bless he what and he, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months then he opened his mouth in blessing against god to bless him his name his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority was given him over every tribal tongue and nation all who dwelt on the earth will worship him whose name have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world if anyone has an ear let him hear he who led into captivity shall go into captivity he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword here is the patience and the faith of saints faith of the saints of the saints thank you so the uh, revelation 13 right verses 1 to 10 in verse 1 um uh john is describing what he's saying so he says look i'm standing on the sand of the sea and i saw i saw a beast rising out of the sea right so now it's 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 a vision it's what he's saying sand so this is now he's he's it's seeing something happening here on earth standing on the sand of the sea on the earth the sea now the sea is typically a prophetic image typically a prophetic image of multitudes nations right? uh, we know that because uh, in, in, over in, in the in the subsequent chapter in revelation 17 uh, we see again uh, the image revelation 17 uh it's this 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 revelation 17 one uh, there's this great harlot and we will come to this chapter we later um uh, who sits upon the waters the seas and then in uh, verse 15 revelation 17 15 it says the waters that you saw are multitudes peoples nations and tongues right? revelation 17 15 so typically i'm not saying every time but typically this prophetic image of a sea or great waters you know like like the sea or the ocean vast expanse of water it, it represents multitudes nations peoples and tongues it means the peoples of the world so he is seeing here out of the sea it means out of the nations is seeing a beast rise revelation 13 um, verse 1 and uh, again this very strange looking because it has seven heads 10 horns and there are crowns on these 10 horns and he his he has a blasphemous name on his heads now um uh seven heads 10 horns and 10 crowns and these head uh, heads are blasphemous names now this picture looks somewhat similar to what we saw in daniel now here seven seven heads seven seven means perfection you know per, uh, something that's perfect that is here come these 
10 horns. Horns are representing uh, power, authority, influence, leadership. So when you compare it with Daniel, there are 10 toes. Or when you compare, that's Daniel chapter 2. Or when you come into Daniel chapter 7, he sees a beast with 10 horns. So seven heads representing, you know, this is leadership that is head, headship or leadership. Seven heads, perfect headship, perfect leadership. That is that these 10 horns carry, 10 horns represent 10 leaders. We're comparing it with Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. And this leadership is actually blasphemous. We will, we will see later on. Right. So that means this is not a God glorifying. This is not a God given, a God raised up type of leadership. It's a blasphemous, it's something anti-God type of leadership. And there are seven crowns. I mean, these are, sorry, 10 crowns, 10 horns with 10 crowns. That means these are 10 leaders. Crowns, of course, are representing authority, dominion, influence. So here are these 10 leaders who are emerging out of these nations. Their headship is blasphemous. That means their leadership that, that they provide is actually anti-God, blasphemous. And they have crowns, they are leaders, they have influence, they have dominion. And then this beast, verse two, is a combination of the leopard, the bear, and the lion. Now, of course, when we read leopard, bear, and lion here by itself, it looks a little strange. But let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. Let's just turn there because we have looked at this before. If you go back to Daniel chapter 7, and uh, when Daniel is having uh, this, uh, this vision, right, verses 4 through 7, Daniel 7, 4 through 7, He's seeing a series of uh, beasts. The first beast is like a lion, which represents, at that time, when Daniel was speaking, the Babylonian empire or king. That is Daniel chapter 7, verse 4. Of the first was like, as he says, I saw four beasts coming up from the sea. And... Uh, then he says, this is Daniel chapter 7, verse 3. He says, I saw four great, great beasts coming out of the sea. And then he says, the first was like a lion. Oh, lion? Daniel chapter 7, verse 4. Revelation 13, verse, um, verse 2 mentions lion. Then he says, verse 5, uh, I saw a bear. A second beast was like a bear. Same, we see a bear in Revelation 13, 2. And then uh, verse 6 of Daniel 7, he says, I saw another beast which was like a leopard. Right? And then uh, in chapter 7, the explanation is given. Right? Uh, uh, in, uh, if you go with me to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 17, uh, the, the angel who comes to Daniel and who speaks to him, he says, those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. So these four are four kings or kingdoms, empires which arise out of the earth. And then he helps him understand, you know, that this, um, uh, these four kings, uh, which uh, we see this later on being explained in, in chapter 8 as well. Uh, he understands that, um, uh, you know, then in chapter 8, verse uh, 20, he talks about the kings of Media and Persia, verse chapter 8, verse 21, Greece. So later on in another vision, he sees the explanation. So we work backwards, we can understand that the lion was representing the Babylonian empire, which was the empire that was in existence. Uh, and then the bear was representing the Medes and the Persians, and uh, and the leopard was representing the Greek Empire. So these these animals or beasts were representing kingdoms that 
from whom came the horns or the leaders, the kings. So now we translate that or we transfer that to Revelation 13 verse 2. So when now we can tell that uh, the uh, Revelation, the leopard that he was talking, uh, that he sees is, and we connect it back to Daniel chapter 7, the leopard is the Greek kingdom. Uh, the bear is the Medes and the Persians. And the lion represents the Babylonian empire kingdom. So now in Revelation 13 verse 2, Daniel is seeing this beast, but this beast is a combination of the Greek, the Medes and the Persians, and the Babylonian kingdoms. And uh, this beast um, ha has all of us, and the dragon gives this beast, verse 2, power and his throne and great authority. So what we understand from uh, Daniel is that this man, this Antichrist, he's going to come forth from this part of the world, this region. Specifically, and I'll just point to you again. We, we saw this earlier, but I'll point it to you again. If you go back with me to Daniel chapter 8, he tells us very specifically, Daniel 8 and verse 8 and 9. Daniel 8. Verses 8 and 9, he talks about the male goat. Uh, in Daniel 8, the male goat represents the Greek empire. Daniel 8, verse 8, uh, the male goat, the Greek empire, uh, became very great. And the large horn, that is the leader, the horn representing the leader, uh, was broken. And in its place, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them, Daniel 8, verse 9, out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Okay. So what is Daniel saying? This male goat representing the Greek empire expanded. So really when Alexander the Great, when he came into power, he expanded, he covered all of uh, Greek, um, Greece, and expanded over into um, modern day uh, Turkey, over expanded all the way across modern day Babylonia, that was Iran, Iraq, Syria, all those regions. And he expanded all the way to touching the northern part of India, right? So you can imagine how great an empire, uh, Alexander the Great, great, the Greek empire became very fast, starting all the way from uh, the eastern part of Europe, which is from Greece, all the way to touching the northern part of India, he conquered, right? So it covered all those regions, and it covered all the regions of, uh, Greece, Persians, which be uh, typically Iran, uh, um, uh, Babylonia, Iraq, and Syria, and all of those regions. It covered all of that. And, uh, but this notable horn, the large horn, Daniel 8 and verse 8, was broken, right? That he suddenly died, lost his power. And then out of that came the four emperors. And then what Daniel 8 verse 9 says is out of one of them, that means out of the four regions of the Greek empire, which, which the Greek empire was broken into after Alexander's death, out of one of those four regions emerged this um, little horn, which later in chapter 8 of Daniel becomes the Antichrist. So, we come back here, Revelation 13, verse 2, and he's saying, look, in this region, 
where there was the Greek, the Medo-Persians, the Babylonians. From that region is coming this Antichrist, that little horn. So we don't exactly which country or which city, but we look at those regions, like all of Greek and all around the neighboring countries. That is basically we're talking about uh, a good portion of Eastern Europe. Uh, we're looking at all of Turkey, uh, around the Mediterranean, because the uh, empire extended all of that, covered all of that, those regions, uh, covered uh, Egypt, even Egypt, the northern part of Africa, and then extended across uh, many of the Arab nations uh, uh, all the way into India. So that's the region, and it was broken into four portions. And uh, we know that from that region, this Antichrist is going to emerge. Right? And not that there are many countries there, notably you would say Greek and Turkey and Syria and Egypt, and you know these are the major countries, but there are other smaller countries as well. But from that comes this person of great influence. Right? And the dragon, I'm now back in Revelation 13, verse 2. The dragon is giving his him power, his throne, and great authority. So this beast of the Antichrist is backed up by the dragon. And then it says here in verse 3, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So... We don't know what exactly this means, meaning uh, what does this mean? Some One of his heads was mortally wounded, but it was healed and the world marveled. Uh, and you know, even when you read uh, you know, different commentaries and what people think about this, it's interesting. Uh, one suggestion is that maybe there is an attempt to destroy this beast, like an assassination attempt to destroy his headship. To un so head representing headship or leadership. Something that is done to undermine his leadership may be an assassination attempt because it says a mortally wounded. But he survived. And so the world marvels. And they respect the beast. So that is one suggestion of what uh, this could mean in Revelation 13 verse 3. And uh, it sounds uh, sounds logical. It sounds plausible. Let me see. It's, it's possible in our day and time that maybe this leader is emerging and, you know, uh, there's an attempt to assassinate him or try to get rid of him. And But he survives and you know, he continues because he's backed up by the dragon. Right? So, but whatever happens in verse 3, whether it's an assassination attempt or whether it is something else that tries to undermine his leader headship, he survives and it makes the world marvel and follow him. That means the people all around the world say, wow, you know, this is a man. This is the kind of man we must be following. And so whatever was done to try to undermine him or destroy him only served to make him more influential, more powerful. He's being backed up by the dragon. Right? So verse 4 says that people actually worship the dragon because they worship the beast. So I look at verse 4 very carefully. They worshipped the beast, but they actually ended up worshipping the dragon. So that becomes the ultimate objective here. That if you can get the nations to worship the beast, they are actually worshipping the dragon, that is Satan, who is empowering this man, the beast. Right? And, uh, and uh, he becomes very powerful and he is able to make, I mean, he... And nobody's able to make war with him, meaning he is so powerful. Militarily also becomes very powerful. 
And uh, it says, verse 5, he begins to speak blasphemies. So this is so much like what we already read in Daniel, that when this little horn comes into power, he begins to blaspheme against God. right? And he begins to speak all kinds of things against God. Right? And verse 5 says he continues for 42 months. So this is talking about the second half of the tribulation period. 42 months, three and a half years. So what we are seeing is the emergence of this beast. Now, our question is, does that mean the beast only shows up in the middle of the tribulation? Or is he there from the beginning of the tribulation? Now, what we must understand is, Daniel told us very clearly that this, and this abomination of desolation will sign a covenant. I'm, I'm quoting Daniel 9.27. Will sign a treaty for one week, that is for seven years. But in the middle of the week, he will break it. So that means this Antichrist has come into power you know, at the beginning of the tribulation, but he has come as a man of peace. He signs a peace treaty. So, and same thing in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul wrote that this, this man of perdition will not be revealed unless the church is taken away, meaning that once the, you know, he who restrains is taken out of the way. So once the church is taken out of the way, then the son of perdition, this man of desolation, Son of Desolation is revealed. That means he comes into power. But he comes as a man of peace. Revelation 6 1, he comes riding on a white horse. And he's given influence. But in the middle of the tribulation, this man who comes riding on a white horse now becomes the beast, the Antichrist. Right? So that's why Revelation 13 1, the emphasis is on a beast. But the beast has already been in power based on Daniel 9, 27 and 2 Thessalonians 2. He's already been in his place of influence from the beginning of the tribulation, that means for the first three and a half years. But it is in the middle of the tribulation, that is in the, uh, the second three and a half years, that he becomes the beast. That means his whole behavior and everything changes. Okay, so that's how we're reading Revelation 13. He's referring to this man as the beast. And he is going to continue for 42 months. He's going to be being like this, the Antichrist, this abomination of desolation. He's going to be like this for three and a half years, this Antichrist. And verse 6 says he opens his mouth and again blasphemy against God. Uh, his uh, blasphemy in the name of God. His tabernacle, so that's the temple, and those who dwell in heaven, even against all the heavenly hosts. He's speaking against God. So he's, 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 he's speaking against the Lord Jesus and all of that. And he makes war with the saints. This is verse 7, Revelation 13, verse 7. He makes war with the saints. So he's going against the people of God, against Israel. Man against everyone who calls on the name of Jesus. He's, you know, he's going against them. And he overcomes them. That means he's, he's killing them. And it says, verse 7, Revelation 13, 7. Authority was given to move every tribe, tongue, and nation. His influence extends globally. So that's why sometimes you'll use, you will hear the term of a world leader. Because here it clearly says, He's going to have influence over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So uh, there's a world leader right, who begins to have great influence over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And verse 8 says, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. So people are going to be attracted to this man. They're going to worship the beast. But remember, when they worship the beast, they're actually worshiping the dragon. So they're going to be drawn to this man who's got such great influence. And uh, verse 8 says, you know, everyone whose names are not written in the book of life, they're going to worship him. Meaning, meaning these people 
are, are, are lost if they worship the dragon, worship the beast, and eventually the dragon, right? So, verse 10, Revelation 13, verse 10 says, you know, this is what gives endurance and faith for the saints. What is it? That the saints know that those who lead into captivity will themselves go into captivity. Those who kill with the sword will themselves be killed with the sword. So the saints are going through a very hard time because this beast, this antichrist, is going is making war with the saints. But this is what gives the saints endurance and faith. They know that those who lead into captivity will go into themselves be taken captives. Those who kill with the sword themselves. I mean, in other words, the saints. This is what gives them endurance and faith that God will deal with these people when the time comes. That these people, the beast and his his subjects, who the Antichrist and those who follow him, who oppress the saints, they're going to face their judgment. They're going to be killed. They're going to be sentenced. So that's what gives the saints endurance and faith when going through such hard times. Okay, so Revelation 13, 1 to 10. Any questions on that? Uh, is everything clear? Any questions? All right, so let's just read the next uh, set of verses and then uh, we will do whatever we can before the break time. So let's read Revelation chapter 13. Verses 11 to 18. So we are continuing now in uh, chapter 13. What does the beast and the false prophet, what do they do during those 42 months, during that second half of the tribulation? This is interesting. Revelation 13, 11 to verse 18. 11 to 18. Somebody could read it for us, please. Thomas, Conan, Siddharth, whoever has a um, word can read. Revelation 13, 11 to 18, please. I'll read that. Go ahead. And, and they heard a loud voice from heaven uh -oh. saying to them, Revelation, thir uh, Revelation 13, 11. Sorry. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. And he exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes them, earth and those who dwell into the worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire came down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those, those signs which he has granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lead. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is the wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of the man. His number is triple six. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, thank you. So look at verse 11. John says, I saw another beast coming of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon so 
now John is seeing and the beast. Now again, you know, this is a combination of some animal, a lamb, and a dragon. Spoke like a dragon, right? So and they had two horns, and um, this beast, another beast. You know, when we come later on in Revelation sixteen, uh, verse thirteen, and also Revelation nineteen and verse twenty, the second beast is referred to as false prophet. False prophet. So we have an idea who the second beast is in the sense he's a false prophet. So he has to do with. Uh, religious worship, you know, worship, false prophet. What do prophets do? Prophets speak on behalf of, uh, a true prophet would speak on behalf of God and get people to worship God. What does a false prophet do? He speaks on behalf of the devil and gets people to worship the devil. And he is a, a messenger of the devil, a religious leader. Right? So this uh, another beast, because we know he's called false prophet, um, uh, he is a religious leader. And what does he do? He exercises uh, the authority of the first beast, that is the Antichrist. So he basically is a delegate of the Antichrist. He is uh, representing the Antichrist. And he causes all who dwell on the earth to worship the first beast. So what's, his, what's the objective of the second beast, this false prophet, this religious leader? His job is to get people to worship the Antichrist, the first beast. But remember, when you worship the first beast, you're worshiping the dragon who is behind this man. And uh, so what does his religious leader do? Verse 13, he performs signs and wonders and uh, he even causes fire to come. So, you know, he's almost like uh, Elijah. You know, he's, he's like, but he's a counterfeit. He's doing signs and wonders in order to get people to worship the first beast, that is the Antichrist. And verse 14 says, he deceives those who dwell on the earth. So he's he's going to have some way of, you know, convincing people, deceiving people into worshiping the Antichrist. So maybe, you know, he must have, must maybe it's a great preacher who can, you know, give wonderful messages and influence the masses of people uh, to get them to worship um, the false, uh, the Antichrist. And uh, he does signs um, and he tells those who dwell on the earth uh, to make an image of the beast. And, uh, you know, so he's getting them to make some image of the beast uh, and, and to worship this image, right? Um, now, in the latter part of verse 14, it says, the beast was wounded by the sword and lived. So, you know, so we, it's connecting back to the verse number three, where there was an attempt to, you know, destroy him. So we see a little bit of explanation on what that attempt was. He was wounded by the sword and lived. So that's why we, you know, people say, maybe it's an assassination attempt, an attempt to kill him, uh, which this beast survived. And that's why people... You know, people um, uh, marvel and they follow this beast. But now in verse 15, uh, what happens is, uh, try to imagine this picture. Uh, this false prophet is getting people to keep an image of the beast. Now, we don't know what this image is, whether it's an image of stone or whether it's just a picture image or whatever it is. But he is able to give power to this image. And this image is able to speak. This image is able to say things. And, uh, and, uh, and it is able to cause, I'm looking at verse 15. This image is able to cause those who don't worship it to be killed. Right? So um, it's a strange thing. To think about, you know, how how would this be done? Yeah. Uh, is it completely going to be supernatural, or is it going to be using technology or something? Now, you know, if you want to think of it in terms of a uh, a natural thing, uh, you know, uh, these days we can think of a robot, you know, uh, a small device that can speak, you know, and it can even 
release energy or power to strike people down. And you can imagine like that. You know, it's very, and I, I'm just going a little side trip here, but um, in some places they've actually created robots of saints and they come and worship it. And that, that robot moves and that robot speaks, uh, but it, it's representing a saint that is being worshiped. You know, so people are trying that out. Uh, it's just interesting. I'm not saying, you know, what verse 14 and 15 or verse Revelation 13, 15 will be a robot uh, that can speak and, you know, release energy and do those kinds of things. Uh, I'm just saying, if you're looking at it from a technology perspective, and these things that people are doing it, and it's very interesting to read an article. I think it, it, I read it on BBC where um, they had, uh, I forget which country this was, but they had a shrine and in the, instead of having, you know, a statue of a saint, they had a robot of that saint. And the robot could obviously speak. It looked almost like, you know, the, uh, the, the, the objective was to make something lifelike, you know, that could speak. And, you know, so uh, when people people would come and, and uh, you know, they would, instead of worshipping, uh, you know, or paying their respects to a statue, uh, here is a robot that, that that moves and talks and just makes them feel very spiritual, whatever, you know. So those kinds of things people are trying out. Uh, so I, I was thinking here when I read Revelation 13, 15, that maybe this image that is being distributed, telling people to, you know, keep it, this may, could be a small image of the, anti, of the Antichrist, which could be a robot that could speak and it can be remotely controlled through the internet. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be. I mean, if it's going to be something different, uh, that's fine. But I'm just trying to imagine how this verse 15 would be done, right? Um, so he tells people to keep an image of the beast. This image will speak uh, and it'll even strike people down uh, dead if they don't worship it. Then, so there is this religious side to this, meaning this false prophet is trying to get people to worship the Antichrist. And this is where we get the idea or this, this phrase of a one world religion. So we talked about a world leader that is the Antichrist because of his influence that he'll have globally. Now we are looking at a kind of a religious system but the objective is to get people to worship the beast, the image of the beast. So that's why we get this term of one world religion. That means this false prophet is trying to go, is going to promote a global religious system. Now, we don't know what the name of this religion will be. Uh, and we shouldn't unnecessarily try and give it a name. You know, sometimes people, yeah, they refer to certain denominations or parts of the Christian religion or sometimes even other religions and say, that's this world religion. I don't think we should do that. It could be something completely new, which this um, false prophet brings into place. It's possible that things are set up, you know, things come together uh, in preparation for what this false prophet would do. Uh, it's, that is possible. But, uh, you know, let's not try to give a name to this. It's just that this false prophet is going to create a religious system trying to get people to worship the image of the beast, thereby eventually worship the dragon. The next thing we'll see, which we will do after we come back from the break, is there is going to be a world economic system, a financial system as well, right? So uh, that is where you would hear the term a uh, 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 one world financial system or an economic system or a one world currency. You know, so people use different terms to talk about that. We will discuss that after the break, right? So let's take a break and we'll come back and we'll pick up with verse 16 from Revelation chapter 13. Okay, see you in 10 minutes. Thanks. <laughs> 